because I love snow. I'm super excited to get snow tomorrow. That means there's a very good possibility we might have a virtual class tomorrow. I looked at the timing of the snow and it looks like it's going to significantly impact my driving, right? And I want to stay safe. All right, so tomorrow uh, it makes sense to go virtual anyways. We're only going to have about hour and an hour and a half of lecture. The rest of the day would be time for you to ask me questions. Uh, so we can do that all uh, via Zoom here. Um, let's see here. All right, today you should be taking down your gravity experiment and taking pictures of it before the plants grow anymore. All right, I put the lab two report up on Moodle, just kind of copy and paste from the original lab report what is due. All right, it's basically writing a, a short paper. All right, I don't expect anything like 10 pages like a normal scientific paper would be. All right, a uh, short paper addressing the topics I have here. I did uh, include in your introduction, cite at least one source from a scientific journal now that we know how to read them. All right, so some keywords you might use here is gravity or gravitropism, all right, just to kind of get you started on that search. Uh, that is not due until next Tuesday, I believe, the 18th. So you have some time to work on this, all right, and that's kind of done purposely because I am steadily falling behind on grading. I want to get you some feedback down on your Lab 1 uh, report, uh, specifically on the pictures and the figure caption. All right, so if there's something that uh, you need to adjust for this lab report, you have feedback from me. All right, so be sure to keep an eye on that uh, in case there is feedback. You're including it on this lab report. Uh, let's see, the scientific reading paper, if you have not turned in that assignment that I assigned yesterday, it is still open up until midnight tonight, so make sure you get that done. Uh, study guide is mostly done, all right? I just have to include uh, information for tomorrow's lecture on it, which I just haven't finalized tomorrow's lecture yet. Uh, that will be posted tonight, all right? So the study guide will be up tonight for you to look at. That way we have it for uh, exam review time tomorrow. All right. Any questions on scheduling logistics, anything in that area? All right, so we're going to talk about plants and nutrients today. All right, it's going to be kind of a, a lecture-heavy day, but I do have some activities at the end that should be kind of fun to do. All right, so I feel like I'm in the dark shadow over here. All right, so why mineral nutrients? All right, well, we know that plants cannot live on water and sunlight alone, uh, not even water, sunlight, and carbon alone. All right, we need more to them. Right, we've seen uh, many different molecules as we've been going through, and if you've been paying attention, there's more to those molecules than just carbon uh, and H2O. Right? There's a lot of other elements in there, so plants need other elements in order to go through their cellular processes. Right? I really like this image because it shows uh, photosynthesis up here, taking in carbon dioxide, leaving the oxygen, or taking out the oxygen and the water, splitting the water apart. Uh, actually, this would be more of uh, a transpiration, wouldn't it? And then on the roots, it shows that we need oxygen uh, in order for cellular respiration. All right, so nutri uh, nutritional requirements. Just like us, plants need nutrients to survive. All right, there are going to be substances that are going to be metabolized by the plants, so going through uh, cellular respiration, breaking them down, being used in other molecules. Uh, or incorporated uh, into a uh, different compound, all right? So the chem chemical elements typically will play a role in plant metabolism, all right? And the nutrients, all right, I put in here that they can be taken from the air, the water, or the soil. Typically, we're going to see nutrients coming from the soil, all right? But we can get nutrients uh, through the air and from water. Now, water, light, and carbon dioxide tend to be limiting factors in plant growth, right? But if plants are limited in any of these mineral elements, right, it's also going to lead to an impact on growth, and they might develop some uh, deficiency sy uh, symptoms that might not allow them to, uh, say, photosynthesize as well, for an example. All right, so I put this image up here because I think it's really interesting to think about the composition of plant tissue. Right? Most of it's actually water. All right, so most of the plant is made up of water, 80 to 90 percent water. The rest is all this dry matter, which we would consider um, 
different mineral nutrients, all right? Most of that dry matter is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, all right? So in the plant itself, we are mostly looking at carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? The rest of all that matter, about like 1% to 2%, right, is going to be those mineral nutrients. So we don't need them in as large of quantities as carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen, but we still need them. Right? And I put up some images here of some different machines that I have used in the course of my research to specifically analyze how much carbon and nitrogen are in a leaf right? using the carbon nitrogen analyzer. Or using this uh, ICP machine up here, we can analyze a whole bunch of different elements found within plants. All right, so when we're talking about nutrients, we can break them into two broad categories. All right, one would be macronutrients. All right, we need these in large amounts. All right, and the plants are going to be unable to complete their life cycle without it. All right, because we need them in such large quantities. All right, function is going to be very specific for these nutrients. All right, so I can't substitute substitute something that needs um, calcium with magnesium, for example. Right? If I need calcium for something, it has to be calcium. All right? And the plant is directly or indirectly using these molecules in plant metabolism. All right? So when we're talking about macronutrients, I put up a nice chart there of where they can be found um, and what they are. So we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight All right? macronutrients we're looking at here. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and sulfur. All right. And if we look at this list, the further we go down, all right, the less of those nutrients we need. All right. So 45% of the plant mass is going to be carbon. If we look at sulfur, only about 0.1% is going to be sulfur. All right. But it still needs it in such a large quantity that we would consider it a macronutrient. All right, micronutrient, kind of think of it as the opposite here, all right? We don't need them in large amounts. We need them in small amounts, all right? But we still need them. All right, again, it's going to be a very specific, all right? Again, I can't, if I need zinc, I need zinc. I cannot substitute that with copper or any other of these nutrients, all right? So there's many more, I, I guess not many more, but there are quite a few micronutrients here. And again, we see that they're in very, very, very small quantities. All right, especially when we start looking at nickel, all right, I'm not even going to try to figure out what percentage of the plant that is, but it is very, very small. And notice that the major source for all of these micronutrients would be coming from the soil. All right, so we need the macronutrients. We need the micronutrients, all right? Macronutrients, we just need more of them. All right, this is going to vary by what specifically we're looking at in a plant. All right, so maybe, oh gosh, and this example is probably totally incorrect, but I'm going to say maybe the leaves need more nitrogen than the roots. All right, so it might vary by different plant tissues. I don't have a good, accurate example off the top of my head on that. All right, but what does this mean physiologically? All right, if we look at the different roles they play in the plant, all right, there's a lot of different functions that these nutrients are needed for. All right, they can be a part of uh, carbon compounds. All right, so any molecule that has carbon in it, all right, nitrogen and sulfur are particularly important in this. Uh, energy storage or just structural integrity. All right, we find that phosphorus, I think that's silica and boron. Ooh, I'm getting rusty on my chemical symbols here. Uh, are important for this energy storage and structural integrity. There's a lot more of these nutrients that are going to just kind of remain uh, in the plant cells in their ionic form. Now, if they're in their ionic form, what that means is that they are, have either lost an electron or have gained an electron. Right? They have some sort of a charge associated with them. All right, the last uh, grouping of uh, nutrients here are going to be involved in electron transfer reactions. All right? So if you remember back to when we talked about photosynthesis, right? and we had that transfer of the electron in the light reactions uh, across that thylakoid membrane, all right? uh, we saw that NADPH was a huge electron carrier there. 
All right. So these elements are going to be very important in molecules such as NADPH and others that are important in transferring electrons. All right. Same similar kind of concept that we talked about when we talked about the light reactions. All right. So how do we determine if a nutrient is essential? All right. Well, we have to grow these plants in a condition where we can target a very specific nutrient. And the best way to do that is a hydroponic culture, all right, using a water, all right? Soils, they're just way too complex, and we will see that uh, tomorrow in class, uh, but they are way, way, way too complex, all right? But these hydroponic cultures, we can have a nutrient solution and essentially take out one nutrient or control the composition of a, the nutrients or, um, the concentration of a nutrient, right? So we can very easily manipulate these hydroponic solutions, growing them in water. If we see the plant is struggling in some way, shape, or form, we can attribute to that very specific nutrient that we took out. All right, so because there's a lot of lecture, I tried to really break it up with just some review questions. All right, so review, what are the most prominent uh, nutrients in cell plants? All right, what are they called? And how would we determine if nutrient is essential? Sounds like most people have had a chance to discuss this here. All right, so what nutrients are the most prominent in plant cells? If I had to hedge a bet, and if I had to pick out one specific nutrient out of a, a hat, for example, what one am I most likely to pick out? Or what one of like three, I should say? Carbon? Carbon? Oxygen. Oxygen. Oxygen and hydrogen. Yeah, those are the three most prominent ones. All right, now we also have some other elements that are very prominent in plant cells. What would they be? Nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, potassium. Yes, and what are those called? Macronutrients. Nice. All right, so if we want to determine if a nutrient was essential to the plant growth of a specific species, uh, what would we try to do? Or how would we set up an experiment? We'll slide on it. Yes. Uh, take away said nutrient and see if they can complete a light, like complete a life cycle without it. If not, then it's it's pretty essential. Yeah, exactly. Take away a nutrient, see if the plant can essentially survive and complete a life cycle. All right, and we're gonna do that in mostly a hydroponic solution because soils are just they're they're really complex. All right. So speaking of essential nutrients, all right, what if a plant does not have enough of a certain nutrient? All right, that's going to lead to a nutrient deficiency. All right, so again, an essential nutrient is essential to complete its life cycle. All right now, deficiency symptoms are going to develop in a plant that might receive too little of an essential nutrient. All right, maybe um, they just happen to land in a patch of soil that just did not have enough nitrogen, for example. All right, uh, so. When they lack these essential nutrients, they're going to display some pretty characteristic symptoms. All right? They might not reproduce. There might be a tissue death. All right? Changes in leaf color. All right? Typically yellow or purplish. All right? <laughs> yes, sometimes purple. <laughs> yes. So uh, when they're yellow, which is the more common one, all right, we would call that chlorosis. 
and I know I'm going a little fast here, so I'm trying to steady oh, myself. Fine. Yeah. So if you have a plant that's in a pot, wouldn't it like run out of nutrients eventually and start dying? Yeah, eventually. Uh, so if you had a plant in a pot, it would eventually just use up all the nutrients, and that's where you'd have to add in some sort of fertilizer to just kind of amend that soil back to what it needs. Oh, yep, okay. yep. All right, so chlorosis, all right, it's a pretty iconic uh, way of uh, trying to figure out if there's a nutrient deficiency is to look for yellowing of leaves, all right? So this plant here is uh, suffering from an iron deficiency, all right? It has these yellow leaves, all right? But many other minerals, if they're deficient in a certain mineral, they will also show this yellowing, all right? This chlorosis. All right, so trying to diagnose a mineral uh, deficiency can be very hard, all right? Es uh, especially when we're talking about plants that are out in their natural environment, they are in contact with a very complex soil structure, all right? It's very hard to, diff uh, very difficult to try to determine what's missing, all right? Uh, for one, there might be multiple mineral or nutrient deficiencies. Right? So it might not just be one that's deficient, it might be multiple, right? which makes it very hard to try to determine. Right? There might be deficiencies of one nutrient or even an excess of one nutrient that's going to mask the problem nutrient. Right? So it's going to mask the effects of the nutrient that it's missing. So that can be sometimes hard to distinguish apart. And then a lot of diseases. Right? A lot of the plant diseases will show similar effects as a nutrient deficiency. Right? So trying to figure out deficiencies can be a very complex thing to do. Right? Even when I'm looking at my own plants that I grow on my balcony, I have a hard time trying to determine what are they deficient in? Why are they turning yellow? All right, so there are some predictable symptoms. Uh, when we're looking at nutrient deficiencies, all right? So a low supply of nutrients can cause um, symptoms related to a role in a plant, all right? So think of different processes like uh, transport of nutrients or photosynthesis, for example, all right? Um, maybe it's uh, structural related to keeping the structure of a plant, all right? It's going to be an uh, expression of these symptoms are going to be related to mobility in a plant. How mobile is that nutrient? And we'll get to that, I believe it's on the next slide here. Right. Most commonly, we're going to see nutrient deficiencies of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. All right. So if you've ever bought fertilizer or you grew up in a farming community, a lot of times we'll uh, put fertilizer on the fields. Uh, that is uh, very, very prominent in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Right. So those are the most common uh, deficiencies. All right, so I mentioned whether or not the nutrient is mobile. All right, so when I mean mobile, all right, we're talking about how easy is it to be transported throughout the plant. All right, so for transporting nutrients, chances are those nutrients are traveling through the phloem. All right, so if they're phloem immobile, right, meaning they can't move, they can't be transported through the plant, all right, they're going to be stuck where they are. So if we, uh, say, use calcium, in some very structural role in the plant, right, when we're just newly forming, right, those leaves, those older leaves are going to have a lot of calcium. But the newer leaves are not going to have as much available calcium to them, so they're the, going to be the ones that start to suffer from that deficiency, right, because the calcium cannot be moved from the older leaves to the newer leaves, right. So that would be an example of an immobile uh, nutrient. Versus if they are mobile, right, as the plant is growing, those new leaves can tap into, uh, say, nitrogen, for example, the bottom picture, can tap into that nitrogen that was used in the uh, older leaves, right? So nitrogen from those older leaves can uh, be transported in the phloem to help the growth of the new leaves, right? They're not stuck in place. They can move to wherever they are needed. All right, so looking at that table there, uh, there's a bunch of different nutrients that can be classified as either mobile or immobile. 
right? And this can play an important role in trying to identify what nutrient deficiency we have, right? So if it's immobile, right, we might notice that the, young, the younger leaves are starting to suffer. If it's mobile, we might notice that it's the older leaves that are starting to suffer, right? That can help us narrow in to, into uh, what specific nutrient might be causing that deficiency. All right, if we're trying to look at deficiencies in the field, all right, we can do some things to try to figure out what the plant is deficient in. Right? We can look for those visual cues, all right, seeing if the, the older or the newer leaves are suffering. Right? But we can also analyze the soil. Right? We can take soil back to the lab and figure out what is my soil missing. Right? Maybe it's one very specific thing and it'll be super obvious. Right? Maybe it's going to be multiple things and it's not going to be super obvious to pick out. We can look at concentrations in the plant tissues. All right, so if we're looking at plant tissues and we've analyzed something and noticed, oh, we don't have as much nitrogen in this plant tissue as maybe we thought we should. All right, that can kind of tell us that maybe nitrogen might be the limiting nutrient here. All right, we can also do studies where we add in nutrients. All right, so if we add in a nutrient and all of a sudden that plant looks a lot healthier, we know that that one might have been the problem nutrient. Right, so one of the things I did in grad school was I did a uh, nutrient addition study. Right? So I had these plants here that I added nitrogen to, right? and I looked to see how well they grew. Right? So these plants were very much adapted to a soil that did not have a lot of nutrient, uh, a lot of uh, nitrogen in it. Right? So I wanted to see, well, what if I added a bunch of nitrogen to them? Are they going to respond positively, or is it going to be kind of like a shock to the plant? Right, so that's how I set up my experiment there. Right, I compared the fertilized and the unfertilized plants to look for differences in plant growth. Right, this is typically going to give you the best type of data when you're looking at these nutrient addition studies. Right, but it's very uh, laborious. Right, so I had to measure these plants every day for about oh, nine months, right? including weekends and vacations, and I had to always be there. It's very uh, time uh, consuming, all right? So as a result, this isn't the almost, this isn't gonna always be the best way to do it, right? but it's gonna give you the best results. All right, so if we've identified a nutrient deficiency, right, there's a couple of different ways that we can treat it, all right? So for example, if we've had a plant in a pot that has just run through all of its nutrients, Maybe it hasn't been repotted in new soil for a while and it just depleted everything in there. All right, we can add an inorganic fertilizer. All right, they're going to be uh, inorganic in compounds. They're going to be very slow releasing. All right. uh, we can add an organic fertilizer, which are typically going to be um, have a lot of compost to them. They're right, going to come from plant and animal residues. Uh, let's see, we can also uh, spray the plants, right? So a lot of times in orchards, this is what uh, uh, people will do is they'll spray the plants down with some sort of nutrient that they're lacking in, hoping that the plant will absorb uh, those nutrients through the leaves, right? So it's not a common way of thinking uh, that that's how plants take up nutrients, but you can take up nutrients through the leaves, right? And then when it rains, some of that uh, spray is going to uh, fall off of the leaves and maybe soak into the soil and plants can continually to take them up that way. All right. So there's different ways to treat them. I'm not going to go too much in depth on them, but know that yeah, we, we can treat them. All right. We have means to do that. All right. So thinking about those nutrients and if they're mobile or immobile, how can we tell? I right, take a few seconds here to talk it out. All right, that seemed like that was a very fast uh, question to answer. 
is good. It means you know your stuff, right? Uh, so if a nutrient is mobile, where might we see the deficiency show up in a plant? In the leaves. The older or the younger leaves? The younger leaves. Yeah, yeah, it's mobile. So we can take that nutrient from the younger leaves and shuffle it into, excuse me, I, I said that backwards, didn't I? We got it correct here. It is the newer leaf, the top of the plant, right? Those new forming leaves. Uh, those are going to be the green ones, all right? The ones at the bottom, the older leaves, those are going to be the ones that have that nutrient deficiency, right? Because we're taking from the old, giving to the young, because it is mobile, all right? So if it is uh, immobile, where are we going to see that nutrient deficiency? Where in the leaves? The new leaves, yeah, yeah, because we can't take from the old leaves and give to the young leaves. The young leaves, they're just going to be limited, all right? They just don't have access to that uh, nutrient. All right, very nice. All right, so when we're thinking about all these nutrients that a plant needs, all right, it seems obvious that a plant might want to hold on to its nutrients so it does not develop a deficiency, all right? And when we're thinking about maybe growing plants on Mars or the moon, where nutrients might be very limited, right? We might try to select for plants that try to conserve their nutrients, right? So there's different ways that plants can do this, all right? They can have very long-lived leaves, right? Meaning they don't shed their leaves as often, right? So maybe they are evergreen, right? They don't shed their leaves every winter, for example, right? They hang on to them so they're not losing the nutrients that are in those leaves. They might have very slow growth rates, right? So if you're growing very slowly, you're not nu using nutrients as fast, all right, to build up more biomass. They might also have very large nutrient reserves, all right? So if we take a look at that, that root system of that plant there, we notice it has a very large tap root right down the middle, right? It has large nutrient reserves in addition to those roots digging down very, very deep to try to always try to find new nutrients, new soil to get those nutrients from. All right, so I'm going to focus on plants that like to keep their leaves, right? Or maybe they keep their leaves a little bit longer than others, right? And this is where it's the importance of senescing leaves. When I say senescing leaves, that means leaves that are essentially dying off and falling off the, the tree, the bush, whatever it might be. All right? And when they fall off, right, they just don't fall off. They typically like turn a color, right? All right? Because typically they're going to reabsorb some of those nutrients back into the plant's body before they let that leaf drop. All right? They want to take in as many nutrients as they can so they have them available for future use rather than just letting those nutrients stay in the leaves and fall to the ground. All right, so that would be plant nutrient reabsorption. All right, now uh, a lot of times it comes, uh, this happens, senescent leaves happens uh, due to water stress, try to prevent water stress. All right, so if you have more leaves, you have more stomata, those stomata are open and they're gonna continually be losing water. All right, so if you get rid of some leaves, right, you can try to get rid of uh, some of that water being lost. Right. Uh, a lot of times these desert plants or trees of uh, cold habitats right, will try to lose their leaves so they're not losing water when it's impossible to try to get more water. Right. So think about the frozen ground. It's hard to get access to that water right now. That's why those plants have lost their leaves so they don't need to use as much water. All right. Uh, these plants, if they have uh, little access to water, they can uh, have a, a danger of xylem embolism. All right? And I threw this one up here, even though we're not talking a lot about that. But a xylem embolism is basically a bubble in the xylem. And if you have a bubble in the xylem, you're essentially breaking apart that chain of water molecules. So that the water molecule is not totally connected, and it's not going to keep going up the plant in a chain. Right? Which if we have a lot of those bubbles and a lot of water is being uh, broken from that chain and not going through the rest of the plant, right, that plant's going to suffer. It's not going to get water to where it needs to be and the transpiration rates are going to decrease. 
All right. It can also help reduce the amount of root mass that they might have to produce, right? So if they're limiting how much water is lost, all right, they can uh, try to limit how much more water they have to gain, all right? So they don't have to grow as many roots to search out the soil to pick up more water molecules. All right, so that's typically how we might think of senescing leaves in terms of water loss, all right? But I want to challenge us to think of senescing leaves in terms of nutrient conservation. All right, so plant nutrient reabsorption. All right, uh, it really helps to limit nutrient loss because we're taking nutrients from the leaves, bringing it back into the plant body. All right, that decreases our reliance on the soil nutrient supply. All right, so once we've gotten those nutrients from the soil, all right. We're keeping it in the plant body. Right? We don't have to seek out more nutrients to replace something that was lost. Right? And the energy and the carbon cost is kind of a trade-off there. Right? Uh, so it's a trade-off in terms of it takes some energy to break down the nutrients and bring it back into the plant. Right? But it's a trade-off because if you don't have access to a lot of nutrients, that might be beneficial to use some energy to keep on or to hang on to those nutrients. All right, so it's very much a trade-off in these energy costs there. All right, so how does a leaf actually fall off of a plant? All right, uh, well, if you remember, when we talked about, watch that video from, from NASA to NASA, where they talked about ethylene gases in the space station causing uh, plants to ripen very quickly, All right? That same ethylene gas is going to help simulate uh, plant senescence from the, uh, from the plant body. Right? So that gas, that ethylene, forms this abscission zone. Right? And we can see that right, in a nice cross section here, all right? but maybe a little bit more clearly in this cartoon image here. It forms this abscission zone, which has these two types of tissues involved. All right. It has a nice separation layer. All right. So we have this separation layer here. It's very, very thin. All right. And basically, it's trying to help protect the plant from uh, essentially having an open wound. All right. So it's kind of cauterizing that the end of that petiole. That way, when it falls off, the plant isn't it totally exposed to the outside environment. All right. Now the underlying tissues here. All right, are going to be uh, tissues that are used for protection, again, to help cauterize that wound, because they have a lot of suberin, which is really waxy. All right, it's really waxy, so it's going to help prevent, say, water loss. All right, so the plant's not going to lose water from that open wound. It can also help protect against any uh, microbial attack. All right, it can kind of stop microbes from entering into that open wound. All right, so that was kind of a side note here, all right? And I think uh, if I did this lecture again, I might move that slide up a little bit because now we're going to jump right back into talking to reabsorption here. All right, so how do we measure reabsorption? All right, how do we know this is actually occurring? All right, well, we look at the nutrient uh, resorption proficiency. All right, so how proficient are they in taking those nutrients back into their plant body? And to do this, we will look at the senesce uh, leaves, right? Essentially, we're going to grind them up, send them off to the specialized equipment that will then look at different concentrations of nutrients in those senesce leaves. And we can compare that to maybe uh, unsenesce leaves, the leaves are still living on the plant, right? What their nutrient concentrations are. Or we can compare that to senesce leaves of other species to see maybe what species is better at resorbing those nutrients. So if we have really, really low values of nutrients in those senesce leaves, right, that indicates that that plant is pretty good at reabsorbing those nutrients. Right? There's not a lot left in those uh, dead leaves that are dropping off the plant. Right, and I, I touched on that last one there, but yeah, we can compare it to published values, values we already know for the plant. Right? And that can indicate how well a species does in nutrient conservation. All right, so if we take a look at this, right, we have species uh, A, B, and C here, right? B 
the green bar is nitrogen, right? and this orange bar is uh, phosphorus. Right? And we're looking at the uh, percentage of nutrients in the senesced leaves. Right? So if we look at species A and species C, we see that they have a greater percentage of these nutrients than species B. All right? Species B really took a lot of those nutrients out of those senescent leaves before they dropped them. All right? So this would indicate that species B is really good at reabsorbing those nutrients back into its uh, plant body. All right? Versus uh, species A and C, not so much. All right? They're losing a lot of nutrients in their senescent leaves. Right? But this can be okay because if they're in an environment, they have plenty of access to these nutrients in the soil, they're not going to spend that energy to take nutrients back in and conserve them if they're easily accessible to them. Right? But plants that might be from these low nutrient habitats, right? they don't have access to a continuous supply of new nutrients. Right? They're going to want to hold on to their nutrients the best that they can. All right? So plants from these low nutrient habitats are typically really good reabsorbers. All right, so if we're looking at who's a good reabsorber, who isn't a uh, good reabsorber, right, we can kind of classify plants into these two different categories, which I have abbreviated because saying high nutrient adapted species over and over and over <laughs> gets really long. All right, so HNAPs, all right, those are the high nutrient adapted species, right, species that have plenty of access to these nutrients. They're typically going to be really weedy species. Right, species that can reproduce fast, that they can grow really fast, right? or crop species. Right? Crop species are uh, adapted to having high nutrients around them. Right? We're not trying to grow crops in the middle of a desert, for example, uh, in most instances. Uh, these LNAPs, right? they're the low nutrient adapted species. All right? So these are species that don't have access to uh, good nutrient supplies. They're typically desert species, uh, chaparral species, which is a, a, an arid environment uh, that in the U.S. we can find in California. All right? And uh, these uh, species called thin boats. All right? Now I think the LNAPs are really, really cool because they have some cool adaptations, All right? which we'll kind of see here. All right? So if we look at these HNAPs, right? I mentioned a little bit of this. They have really, really fast growth rates. Right? So they can grow really fast because nutrients they are not being limited by. Right? They're going to respond to being fertilized with even more growth. Right? If we give them more nutrients, right, they're going to use those nutrients up immediately and put it right into new growth. Right? They're not going to store as many nutrients because why bother storing it if you have ample access to them? Right? The leaves might be shorter lived. Again, because you can have ample access to nutrients, uh, so those nutrients in the leaves, all right, you can just gain more from the soil, so those leaves don't have to live as long. They can invest less in roots relative to the, to the shoots, right? So they don't have to uh, grow as many uh, roots, to try to explore the soil to find more nutrients, because nutrients are available, right? So they're going to put most of their energy into growing the above ground structures, right? And infection by uh, fungal symbionts are, are going to vary with nutrient availability. And we're going to talk about the fungal aspect of this in just a little bit. All right, these LNAP species, all right, they have really cool adaptations. All right, they, they're often really slow growing, all right, regardless of nutrient supply. All right, so if I gave them more nutrients, all right, they're not going to respond by growing faster. Right, they're still going to have this slow and steady growth rate because they want to conserve their nutrients because they know they don't always have access to a lot of nutrients in the soil. Right, because they don't have access to a lot of nutrients, they're going to have a lot more roots to try to explore that soil. Right, they're going to maintain higher tissue nutrient concentrations because they're trying to store uh, those uh, nutrients in their tissues. Right, they're going to have really long-lived leaves. Right? So they're going to let their leaves live as long as they possibly can to maximize photosynthesis before dropping them, right? because they don't want to lose those nutrients in the leaves. They're going to be really, really good at reabsorbers. 
All right, so nutrient recycling, uh, reabsorbing those nutrients back into the plant body, they're going to be really good at that. All right, and low variable in these, uh, low variability in the fungal symbionts, which again, we'll, we'll get to in just a bit. All right, so what if these two uh, types of plants all of a sudden had low nutrient availability? All right, well, in these high nutrient adapted species, all right, they're going to reduce shoot growth. Right, because they're going through nutrients so fast, and then all of a sudden they don't have any, right? they're not going to be able to grow like they normally grow. Right? They have no reserves. They have stored no nutrients away, essentially. So they can't go back into, say, a tap root and grab those nutrients out. Right? They're going to have decreased uh, nutrient concentration, because right? they're still going to try to grow, right? but they're just not going to have a, uh, the abundance of nutrients in their leaves. They're going to try to increase uptake rates, to try to increase the rate that they take up nutrients from the soil, to try to get even more. All right. And they might have these very, very visual deficiency symptoms. Right. It's going to be pretty easy to see when they are deficient in nutrients. All right. And we're not going to talk about expression of high affinity carriers. Right, because that goes beyond the, the scope of this class a bit. All right, now versus these low nutrient adapted species, right, if they all of a sudden have fewer access to nutrients, we're not really going to see a detectable uh, slowing in their growth rate, right, because they've had nutrients stored up to begin with. They can rely on those stores of nutrients. They have slow growth rates to begin with, so they're not rapidly growing, right, so their growth rates are going to be pretty, pretty stable, right? They have these vast root systems, which can help them explore new soils and gain different nutrients, right? So maybe they're, they're putting more growth into their roots to try to find some nutrients they haven't tapped into yet, right? And they've typically already formed a lot of uh, symbiosis with uh, species in their roots, all right? So think about mycorrhizae that we, we talked about or that I had you watch a couple of videos about. All right, so if you were to engineer a plant to survive on Martian soils, what traits would this plant have? I think about those traits we just talked about. Really quiet. All right. So, what traits would the plant have? All right. What is what is one trait it might have? A lot of roots. A lot of roots. Yeah. Uh, I might have a vast root system to try to explore the soils better. Yep. Because we know Martian soils don't have a lot of nutrients. All right. What's another trait? Can you yeah, it's going to try to store whatever nutrients it has that might be excess, right? So it's not going to uh, have a lot of new growth because it's going to try to store and conserve those nutrients, right? What's another trait? Kind of related to that, be like slow growing for conservation rotation. Yeah, slow growing, right? Slow growing because it knows it's not going to have a lot of nutrients to keep up that growth rate. Yeah. Yeah, so they're going to be very, very good at reabsorbing those nutrients from their, their leaves that they're going to end up dropping. Right? Any other traits that we might attribute to a Martian, a good plant to, to, to grow on Martian soil? All right, I think you got the key ones there. Right? There's definitely some other traits out there, but in terms of uh, nutrients, yeah, we, we talked about some good ones. All right, so...
we have these nutrients, right? And we know that they can move throughout the plant. How exactly do they move in the plant, right? So if we're talking about long distance transport of nutrients, we're talking about the phloem, right? So yesterday we talked about xylem and water. Today we're talking about phloem and nutrients, all right? We can have transport of not only nutrients, but maybe different regulatory molecules like hormones, all right? And it's also gonna help to re redistribute um, water or other compounds, all right? So it's not just nutrients, right? There's actually a lot of water transport happening here too. All right, it's the process of moving these sugars, all right, to where they are produced, to where they are needed, is called translocation. All right, so we think about uh, maybe the, the sugars that were made by photosynthesis, all right, or the nutrients taken up by the roots, all right. Why do they even need to move? All right, because there's uh, differences in needs between sources and sinks. All right, so sugars are always going to move from a source to a sink. Same with nutrients, source to a sink. All right, so a source is any organ producing more sugar than they require. All right, so pretty typical source would be leaves. All right, leaves are actively photosynthesizing and actively producing sugars. All right, if we're thinking about roots, all right, the source might be, or sorry, if we're thinking about nutrients, Right, the source might be in the roots, right? Because that's where the nutrients are actively being taken up at. Right, versus a sink. Right, a sink might be a non-photosynthetic organ. Right, maybe it's the roots, maybe it's flowers. Right, they're not photosynthesizing, they're not making their own sugars. Right, so they need to gain sugars from those sources. Right, if we're thinking about nutrients, right, the sinks are going to be any place in the plant that needs to use or it needs to actively use those nutrients, all right? So basically any other spot besides the roots, essentially. All right, now if we're thinking about sources and sinks, right? Not all are gonna supply, not all sources are gonna supply all sinks, right? It's gonna be related to how close they are to one another, all right? So uh, if we look at this image here, we see maybe the topmost leaves are supplying uh, the sink, which is an actively growing meristem here, right, versus these leaves that are further away, they're not really supplying that sink so much, right? So proximity really plays a role. Uh, development plays a role, right? So uh, if this uh, sink is an actively growing area, all right, it contains a meristem, all right, it needs a lot of nutrients, all right? It's going to be kind of a nutrient hog, all right? Uh, so it's going to really try to take up a lot of sugars from maybe more sinks than someplace that isn't as actively growing. And finally, vascular connections, right? Who are you connected to directly, right? If you're more directly connected to uh, leaves at the top versus leaves at the bottom, right, you're probably going to get your, your sugars from the leaves at the top. All right, so as I mentioned, right, the phloem, Water is actually most abundant, right? So phloem has a lot of water and then all these different uh, nutrients and uh, molecules that it's transporting will be dissolved in that water, right? So that might be carbohydrates like sugars, might be proteins, might be hormones, it might be those inorganic ions, those nutrients that we need, right? But together the water and all the solutes that are dissolved in that water, we would call the phloem sap, right? And if you remember, those phloem saps are going to uh, flow through those sieve tube elements, all right? But we don't just have sieve tube elements, we also have companion cells, all right? So these companion cells are playing a really important role in conveying the sugars into those sieve tube elements, all right? They're helping to load the sugars into the phloem, all right? A, a lot of times the sugars will... Uh, be made into the uh, form of sucrose, all right, for long-term travel. So glucose uh, is what's typically produced. Glucose will be turned into sucrose for long-distance travel. And there's two types of phloem loading that we can talk about, all right. One is called sim uh, symplastic, which means that it's going to travel within the cells, inside of the cells, 
from inside of a cell to inside of a cell to inside of a cell versus a uh, type of loading that is partly apoplastic. Okay, so the apoplast is the space in between the cells. All right? So in between the cell walls. All right? So it can be uh, partially outside of a cell, have to be transported into a cell before it can be loaded into the phloem. So if we look at this symplastic phloem loading, all right, we see that we have our sugar producing cells. All right? We have our companion cells right next to our sieve tube elements. So essentially, our sugar-producing cells, they are producing sugars, right? Remember all the way back to, I believe it was day two, where we talked about the plasmodesmata, right? They're plasma membrane line channels that directly connect cells to one another, right? So you don't have to go through a cell wall or go across a plasma membrane, right? Those sugars are traveling directly to the companion cell via those plasmodesmata, and then directly into the sieve tube elements via the plasmodesmata, right? This doesn't require any energy, doesn't require ATP, right? And we don't have to cross any plasma membranes. Right, that other type of loading, right, is a little bit symplastic in that it's traveling between cells, right? But these sugar-producing cells are uh, basically uh, sending its sugars outside of the cell Right, so they have to transport it across the plasma membrane. It's going to flow towards these companion cells, right, and they have to be once again transported across the plasma membrane, right, before they can go through our plasmodesmata into the phloem. Right, so it's a little bit more energy intensive. Right, we have to use ATP to travel across our plasma membranes here. Right, uh, but it's it's helpful when your source cell is far away from the phloem. Right, the actual transport itself is going to move via bulk flow. Right? So it's going to be driven by pressure gradients. So essentially pressure is built up at the top. Right? So we have a lot of solutes in there. Right? And uh, due to osmosis, water is going to want to come in and try to equalize uh, the, the water molecule to solute molecule ratio. Right? That's going to exert a lot of pressure on these cells. Right, which causes pressure to build up at the top, right? And at the bottom where we don't have as many solutes, right? We don't have as much water entering into our cell, uh, which means that it has lower pressure, right? So a buildup of pressure is a driving movement via bulk flow, all right? So pressure gradient is key here. And unlike xylem, right, phloem can move uh, bidirectional doesn't just move from the bottom to the top of the plant, it can move in all sorts of directions. And in terms of unloading uh, the, the sugars, right? so the sugars have made it to where they need to be, we need to unload it to the cells that need to use those sugars. All right? uh, it, it's pretty easy uh, to do because the concentration of the sugars in the sink is always going to be lower than in the sieve tube elements. All right? So the concentration of our, our, our sink cell here is very low in solutes. Solutes want to move from high to low concentration. It's going to flow into our sink cell. All right, sugars can be uh, consumed by growing tissues in our sink cells, right, or they can be converted to starches and uh, for storage. All right, I know this is a long lecture day. I promise we're almost over with it. All right. But what is an example of a source? What's an example of a sink? Right? And where is the pressure going to be the greatest? The source or the sink?
Triggers definitely. That's what I was thinking of, but roots definitely. We're thinking of nutrients instead of uh, triggers. Yeah. All right. What about a sink? What's a good example of a sink? Old leaves. Flowers. Yeah, I want to say old leaves because at that point they might be going through nutrient reabsorption rather than needing nutrients. Is a flower one? Flowers. Yeah, they're they're a really good example of a sink. Flowers need a lot of nutrients to, you know, produce pollen, eventually produce seeds or fruits, right? They need a lot of nutrients. Uh, what might be another sink? Growing meristems. Yeah, places that are actively growing. And roots. Yeah, I heard roots. Roots would be a good example of a sink if, uh, especially if they're storing different nutrients or storing sugars in their roots. Yeah, definitely. Any questions so far? All right. I believe I just have this last section here. All right. So when we're thinking about nutrients, right, thinking about sugars, right, there's a really cool mutualistic relationship that can occur in the roots. All right. We can have a, a relationship between um, mycorrhizal fungi and plant roots. All right. So mycorrhizae, uh, mycorrhizae really means fungus root. Right? If we broke down that word into its terminology, it means fungus root. Right? So they're going to associate with the roots of a plant. Right? These fungi are. And the roots are going to exchange sugars for nutrients. Right? Especially phosphorus. Right? I'm not sure why it's phosphorus per, or in specific. I'd have to look that up for you here. But Phosphorus is a really key nutrient that they like to exchange. Okay. So because these mycorrhizae are exchanging nutrients for sugars, right? The, the fungi are giving them nutrients, the plants are giving the fungi sugars, right? The presence of these fungi really increases the effective root length. Right? So if you think of those fungi as extensions of plant roots, right? We're increasing our root length with a, as much as like a hundredfold more. Right. This increases our nutrient uptake. Right. We're basically increasing our surface area by a, a whole bunch. Right. And these fungi are found in a lot of plant species. Right. We're, we're finding them in like 85% of plant species have this relationship with fungi. Right. Which is pretty cool. Right. So there's two different types of mycorrhizae. All right. One is ectomycorrhizae. They grow on the surface of a root, right? We can see this root is covered with ectomycorrhizae here, right? Versus endomycorrhizae, they're actually going to penetrate into the root and grow between cells in the roots, right? So if we look at those ectomycorrhizae, right, they're growing outside of the root, right? We have these fungal hyphae, right? these extensions right, that are going to completely cover the root surface. Right? We see they're kind of forming like a, a dense mat around the root. Right? Now they can grow between uh, cell walls, right? but they do, are not going to penetrate those cell walls. Right? And this net uh, kind of on the outside of our root here is called a hartig net. I think it's just kind of a, a fun word to say. And right, we can see down here, this is an, an actual root covered with fungal rhizae. 
right? It's covering the, uh, the entirety of the outside of that root there. All right, versus these endomycorrhizae, right? They grow into the plant cell walls, all right? So if we're looking at uh, our cartoon image here, they can grow inside of the plant cell walls, right? Now they typically are not going to penetrate the, the plasma membrane, but this picture is very deceiving and that it looks like that is exactly what is happening, right? But they're basically going to stick to inside of these cell walls, all right? They're not going to penetrate that plasma membrane. And they can form different structures that kind of help with the communication and absorption of nutrients here. Uh, they can form uh, arbuscules and vesicles, right? We can see uh, kind of like these, all these clumping features here, all right? And again, we're really just increasing our surface area here, right? And these uh, plant roots, which my arrows are a little messed up here, all right? This fungal hyphae is really should be pointing to these very, very thin strands. All right, now, these mycorrhizae are really interesting uh, before we move on to our next set of uh, relationships because they really allow for communication between different plant species, which hopefully you picked up on uh, with those videos I had you watch, right? In fact, I believe uh, Avatar, the movie Avatar, how these those plants communicate with each other, the idea originated from the idea of these mycorrhizae uh, forming this communication system between plants. All right, so mycorrhizae, they're, they're really awesome, really cool. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of cool videos out there on them. So I think I, I gave you the, the cool one that I found was like that economy system that they have. All right, so they, they're really, really cool interactions that we're still learning more about every day. All right, besides mycorrhizae though, all right, plant can also have associations with uh, soil bacteria. All right, specifically bacteria that are going to fix nitrogen. All right, so in the air that we breathe, right, there's a lot of nitrogen available, right? It's really, really rich in the air in its gaseous form, right? But this form is not available to be used biologically, right? This nitrogen has to change its form before a plant can actually utilize it, all right? So in this image here, lightning often will fix nitrogen in our air, all right? But so will these soil bacteria. All right, and because lightning is a few and far between and only hits very specific areas, right, these soil uh, bacteria really play a, a more crucial role for plants in order to uptake uh, nitrogen. Right? So we have to change this nitrogen right, into a different form that plants can actually use in their cells. All right, and I put this image up here that we are using an enzyme to help with that, right? and it needs a lot of ATP in order to do so. Right? But these bacteria, uh, they're able to do it. All right? They can fix this nitrogen. Right? And plants will benefit from it because the nitrogen is already fixed from them. They don't have to use that ATP themselves. Right? So there's different types of nitrogen fixing plants. Right? Plants that can do it on their own. All right? They will expend that energy to uh, fix nitrogen. There's a lot of legumes, all right? it's like the, the pea family. They will have... Uh, the ability to fix nitrogen. All right, these actinorhizal plants, um, they also have the ability to fix nitrogen. And then some other species, such as cyanobacteria, they can also fix uh, nitrogen in some cases. All right, all right. Oh, I thought I had another slide there. All right, but a lot of times they're going to associate with these nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil. All right, and the same kind of association occurs. All right. The, the bacteria are going to give the plants nitrogen in exchange for sugars. All right, and that's what I thought I had another slide on, but it looks like I did not put that on there. All right, so if we had to think about these mutualistic um, um, associations that the plant has, right, how might the, that by, uh, be affected by changes in soil nutrient availability, or it might be affected by decreases in photosynthetic activity? How is that going to change that relationship?
There's a really good discussion on this year, right? and I think that video that you watched on the economy of the soil really probably helped on this question. All right, so how might mutualists be affected by changes in the soil nutrient availability? What's going to change about that relationship? There would really be an equal exchange. Yeah, the there wouldn't be an equal exchange, right? The the uh, the, either soil fixing bacteria or the mycorrhizae are not going to have as much nutrient to give the plants, right? Even if the plant has an abundance of sugar. And as we saw in that video, that that might even stop the exchange from happening, right? Because uh, they want a fair and even exchange, right? What about if uh, we had a decrease in photosynthetic activity? Yeah. Exactly, kind of the, the opposite effect going on here. Not enough sugar to give the, the fungi or the bacteria, uh, so those mutualist, uh, uh, mutualistic organisms are not going to give as many nutrients back to the plant. Nice. All right. So for tomorrow, all right, if you haven't read uh, done the scientific paper uh, assignment yet, it's due tonight by midnight. All right, there is a response paper which should be easy five points for you to do, talking about uh, equality and equity in space exploration, which I think is an important topic to kind of touch upon. All right, two videos to watch for the quiz tomorrow. All right, uh, Monday we do have the exam, so tomorrow afternoon we will uh, be going over with some exam review, uh, probably via Zoom. I will send out a confirmation email just so you uh, actually know if I'm going to be here or not. Like I said, pro probably not. I'll keep an eye on the weather, though. If I can make it down, I am going to make it down. All right. Uh, endurance on Tuesday. Lab 2 report on gravity on Tuesday. So remember to take down your uh, experiments today. Take some good pictures of what happened. All right. Uh, let's see. I have a couple of activities here. Kind of on your own. Do it yourself. Earn a few in-class points. Are we feeling that we need a break first? Yes, all right, I thought so, I thought so. So go ahead, uh, take, well, let's take a good 15-minute break because, again, that was a lot of information. When you come back, there will be some activities. We'll go up to the greenhouse. We'll try to become a, a plant doctor. I have a question. Yeah.